Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Coombs. I am here with my partner, Marina Parkin, and John Seifer, the infamous um, CEO bootcamp guru. Today is Tuesday, uh, November 17th. We are here today to talk about whether or not you actually need a plan for next year. I mean, it was basically um, the biggest waste of money anyone had was the planner for 2020. So um, <laughs> maybe we're going to have a little bit different game here in 21. Um, we talked to you a lot about tax planning, but this is an opportunity to really talk about planning for your business and how, it, how it's going to unfold. It's not just um, going to happen without some intention, or if it does, that may not be what you wanted to happen. So it's sort of like driving without uh, a destination on the map. So as always, John, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your um, input. My pleasure. Um, as we go, John is gonna share his um, presentation, but as we go, please keep in mind that you can enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. I'll monitor those and interrupt John as we need. And also these webinars as always are recorded and distributed. You can go to our websites, coonsassociates.com and coonsparkin.com and the library of all prior recordings are there. So if you wanna catch up on any of these series, you can certainly do so at your convenience. So thank you, John, for joining us. My pleasure. So let me share my screen and, uh, and we'll get going here. So as Joanne mentioned, this is the, the topic for today. I hadn't really considered it as um, relating to 2020, but this is something I think about every year because um, it, it's that time of year again. And I don't mean the holidays. I mean, the time when everybody says, oh, we should have an annual planning session. So you get uh, some of your people in a room or you go off site or you do whatever and you, you do all these plans. And today we're talking about, do you really need to do that? So um, I want to thank Joanne and Marina for having me here. Uh, my name is John Seifer, as she mentioned. I've owned companies all my adult life. Uh, I've started some, bought some, sold some. Some had a plan that worked. Some had plans that didn't work. Some didn't have a plan, and they worked. Um, <laughs> even if the plans didn't work, all but one of my companies did, and the, the one that didn't was the first one. So uh, after that, they all worked. And for the last 20 years, I've been helping other business owners learn from my mistakes at CEOBootCamp.com. And this session is about what I've learned about plans. And I'm going to start with two concepts that you might not think are related to planning. The first one is a quote by Peter Drucker, who said, there's surely nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency what should not be done at all. <laughs> and that relates to the 80-20 principle. Um, this is my quote about the 80-20 principle. The most efficient way to do something is to not do it at all. Mm -hmm. Not always the most effective, and that's what we're going to get into today, but, but it certainly is the most efficient. And the 80-20 principle, as many of you know, it's about the idea that you get 80% of your results from 20% of your activities. Um, this, those numbers are not exact, but the principle is pretty pervasive. And your job as a leader of your organization and also of your life is to determine what should not be done at all and then get really good at the 20% that gives you the 80% of your results. And so today we'll see if the effort of doing a plan is part of the 20% that really pays off for you. And this is not a one size fits all, but I'll give you some ways to think about it. And, or whether a plan is part of the 80% that you should 86. So what is a plan? Well, a plan is a, you consider it as a map of the future something that guides you in how to spend your time, how to spend your money, how to allocate resources and, and the results that you should expect. But this is actually the wrong question. The first question you should ask is, what is a plan for? And a plan for, the reason for a plan is for your end goals. It's to help you get to your end goals. And there's a quote um, on the internet, if you keep doing what you've always done, you will keep getting what you've always gotten. I, I think Yogi Berra said that or Mark Twain or whatever, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who knows. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually said you shouldn't believe everything you read on the Internet. So I'm not <laughs> sure who, who said this. But the point of this is it's true. If you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always gotten. And my question is, is that bad? If it's not bad, then you probably don't need a plan. You're going to get there anyway. 
So if you're happy with where you're headed, if a plan won't really change what you do, what your people do, how you spend time, how you allocate your resources, you probably don't need one. Or if you won't look at the plan and use it as a tool after you've made it, then you certainly don't need one. And I, uh, you know, I, this has happened to me with a lot of my clients where they go, yeah, we had this, it's time to do our plan again. Let's dust off last year's plan. And this is the second time we've looked at it since we made it. Um, maybe we should, you know, do something about it. Well, mm -hmm. if that's the case, I'm going to say, don't spend the time and money on a plan. Use it for a party and do something else. But there is one thing uh, that you should be aware of if you decide not to do a plan. And that is that plans help you avoid the local maximum. So what is the local maximum? Well, this looks like a Halloween uh, picture, you know, and there's some monster out there called the local maximum. That's not exactly it. But let's say it's foggy out, meaning we don't have a plan. And you're trying to climb a mountain. And you know, because even though you don't have a plan, you know that up is good and down is bad. So every time you take a step, if you're going up, you're headed in the right direction. And if you're going down, you pivot and swivel till you're going up. And so you keep one foot in front of the other and you move and you move. And then one day, every direction that you go is down. Well, you must be at the top. You have reached the top. Everything, you, you, you know, that's it. And then the fog lifts and you find out you're here and you're not here. If you had had a plan, you might have gotten to that place better. Now, if you want to get to that red star place, the better goal, instead of the local maximum, you have to go down to get up. And if you'd had a plan from the beginning, you could have maybe gone around the side and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the danger. And let me translate this into what I see happen in business sometimes. Again, without a plan, it's foggy. But we know that more is better, more revenue is better, more profit is better. And if you keep getting more, you keep doing what you're going to be doing. So you add capacity, you add people, you add equipment, and you, your business grows. And it may grow into something that's not as good as what it could have been if the fog had lifted earlier in your journey. So if you want to end up somewhere different from where you're going, then maybe a plan will help. And so that's how you think about whether you need a plan. If you're headed there naturally and you're going to be thrilled to get there, great. If you're not going to use the plan, then don't bother. But if you want to make a plan, let's talk about how to do that. The most important part of a plan is a measurable goal. Mm -hmm. And I want to break this out for you. A measurable goal means there should only be one goal per plan. Now, it's fine to have several goals as long as each one has a plan that you're working with simultaneously. But sometimes, if you have two goals, they're really subsets of a bigger goal. So let's say you have a goal to increase revenue, and you have another goal to decrease expenses. Well, maybe those are subsets of a bigger goal, which is profit. And so you should put that plan together with that one goal. The second thing is the goal has to be measurable. That means you have to know if you've reached it or not. So usually this means numbers. Uh, certain sales revenue numbers or profit numbers or employee headcount numbers, et cetera. It's not always numbers, but it always needs to be explained so that you know whether you reached it. So let's say your goal is employee morale. How will you know if you've improved employee morale? You need to describe in detail, and these are some of the harder ones to describe than numerical ones. But how would you know that employee morale is better? Well, maybe you'll see more cooperation. Maybe you'll see people working uh, across departments. Maybe you'll see more smiles. Maybe mm -hmm. you'll see more people, um, you know, coming in on time or working late or, uh, or going home and having a good time. Whatever makes sense for you for employee morale, you want to describe it in a way that you'll know if you've reached your goal. Often as entrepreneurs, we tend to be so intuitive, we just go, I'll know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. Well, that mm -hmm. attitude is actually for pornography. And <laughs> this is true. There was a justice on the Supreme Court, Justice Stewart, in 1964, and was trying a case about pornography. And he said, I can't define it, but mm -hmm. I know it when I see it. So when people say, I know it when I see it, that's a clue about them that they should be on the Supreme Court. 
So <laughs> that's not how you want to have your goal. So you want to start with the measurable goal. And there's three types of goals. There's the roof shot, the moon shot, and the BHAG. The BHAG stands for Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal, which is a term coined by uh, Jim Collins, I think, in his book, Good to Great. And those are the goals that everybody talks about when you're setting goals. It's the things that uh, John Kennedy said when he was president. We want to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. It's mm -hmm. something that Bill Gates said before computers were everywhere. He said, I want to see a computer on every desk and in every home running Windows or one, running Microsoft. This is before Windows, running Microsoft software. These are these huge goals that you really don't know how you're going to get there. And those goals are not for everybody, but if that's the kind of goal you want to set and it's, you've got the team that will be inspired by that, go for it. The middle one here is the moonshot. The moonshot is also called a stretch goal. This is a goal that you do know how to get to, but you're not sure if you can actually get there. Uh, I, I live in Pittsburgh and right now the Steelers are nine and zero for the first time in franchise history. So their goal is obviously the Super Bowl. Um, they know how to get there. Don't know if they will. Uh, don't know if they'll win. That's a stretch goal. The good news about a moonshot is even if you don't make it, a lot of times you get farther than you would have. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the roof shot is a goal that you know how to get there and you damn well better. Um, you're pretty assured of getting there, but you just need to push in that direction. So this reminds me of... Uh, the comedian George Carlin, who was asked about his religious beliefs, and he said he's a Frisbetarian. And they said, what's that? He said, I believe when you die, your soul leaves your body and it gets stuck up on the roof somewhere. So <laughs> you could be a Frisbetarian. <laughs> My point about these three goals is the goal should inspire people. And you have to decide for your people which kind of goal is inspired, inspiring. Some people are inspired by a roof shot. It's a goal we can hit, and boy, it feels great to have that success. Others are inspired by a moonshot. Some are demoralized by the moonshot. They're like, whoa, that's way too much, and if we don't hit it, it's going to feel terrible. Others are, hey, if we don't hit it, we, we got a lot farther than the roof. Um, so you have to decide for you and your people and your situation what kind of goal you want. The goal serves as a direction, and it also serves as a filter. It says we're going this way and we're not going that way. So as you set your goal, it should give you a way to make a choice throughout the year or the quarter, whatever time period that goal is for, where you say, yes, this fits into our goal, so we're going to do it, or this doesn't fit, so we're not going to do it. If the goal doesn't help you say no to things, then it's not really uh, helping you focus. So the most important part of the, of the plan is a measurable goal. The second most important part is accountability. Accountability is the commitment to, that somebody has that says, I am going to make sure we accomplish this goal. And in many cases, when you make a plan, you break that plan into sub category, so milestones, different parts, those might have a different person accountable for each one of those, but somebody needs to be accountable. If everybody is accountable, then guess what? Nobody's really accountable. Mm -hmm. So that's the second part of the plan. The th next one is application, which means you're going to apply this plan throughout the time period. You're not just going to set it and forget it. Uh, you'll come back and your thing will be all burnt. Um, you want to make sure that you use this. It's a living document. It's something that you can continue to, to refine and to inspire people and to set direction and give them focus. So those are the top three important parts of a plan, a measurable goal, accountability, and application. And there are some planning processes that only use these three. One is called OKRs, which we don't have time to get into now, but it's um, you could Google that uh, phrase and see tons of stuff about how to do it. It's called objective is the O and KR is um, the key results. The objective says this is where we're going 
and we're going to measure our progress by these key results. And that's really all this kind of a plan has. It has a, the goal, which is the objective. It has the accountability and the application, and that's all you need. We'll get to a little bit more of that when we get to the planning document. But other plans have some extra pieces. They have action steps, which break down the, the goal into sub goals or milestones. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we going to do differently? Who's going to do what? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Uh, they have assets. Assets means what resources are you committing? What, are you, what do you need for each of those steps in terms of money, personnel, time, uh, training, et cetera, tools? And, and the achievement is those, how will you measure progress, not just at the end goal, but in intermediate steps, intermediate milestones. So those are the, the six steps if you want to go the more traditional plan route. And typically, when we think of a plan, we think of the plan document. So what does that look like? Well, the minimalist one, like I said, is the OKRs. It basically says, this is the objective. This is how we measure it. Now go to work. And people can, if you, you sometimes set a company-wide objectives and key results, and then you can break those down into different departments if that's relevant, because sometimes different pieces of that are more relevant to one department than another. So that's the most minimal plan. The traditional plan has the goals and then it shows what to ignore. It helps you memorialize decisions that you've made because of this goal, because of this plan, we're going to go here because we're going to take this action step in the first quarter, this action step in the second quarter, we're going to divvy up these responsibilities. A good plan should include assumptions. It should say, this is why we think the plan is the right one. Because as I said at the beginning, a plan is a map of the future. Well, by definition, the future is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes something comes up that really changes your whole plan. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. Sometimes that's COVID. <laughs> um, Mm -hmm. And the plan should have assumptions about why you're making these choices. That will give you the option to adapt the plan or to throw it out when that's the right thing to do. Sometimes an incredible opportunity that you never saw coming shows up and you go, well, we can't do that. We're going to stick to our plan. Well, no, not, not if, you know, if it's a better thing. So that's what those assumptions pieces includes. And then it lays out the milestones. Here's what we expect to hit by when, here's what we expect to do by then. And it includes your, your spending plan, your um, resources here. We're going to hire some people for this, or we're going to reassign people for that. So that's how that plan should lay out. And it should be very detailed if you need that level of detail. So do you need a plan? Yes, if it gets you to your true maximum and not your, goal, your local maximum, and yes, if you will use it continually. If not, like I said, don't do a plan, spend the time, spend the money, have a party instead. Mm -hmm. So that's your choice, party or plan, you know, it goes like that. So that's kind of my summation of, uh, do we need a plan? I'm gonna open it up for questions or to hear uh, Joanna Marina, your comments. If you want a copy of this deck, you can email me if there's anything I can do to help. Uh, help you or your company. I also do facilitation for planning sessions. If you need that, get in touch with me. There's my email. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I can say from our experience, um, not it's not just the plan. The plan is great, but it's really the exercise of making the plan that really helps you kind of come to Jesus and be honest with yourself. And when you do make that roof shot and you do get close to that moonshot, it feels really good. So what you thought was really out of reach, um, you can start to suddenly see in your sights when that happens, that's really great. When it doesn't happen, like for us, it's, it's not going to happen this year. Um, but we're able to look back and say, well, there was a pandemic. <laughs> and, you know, we had some hair tur hairpin turns uh, that we weren't anticipating when we made our plan. And yet we still pretty much hit our roof shot. So we weren't close to our moonshot. But we got at or near the roof shot with 
a global pandemic. Like that's pretty awesome. So when you do feel yeah. those days when you're like, oh man, nothing's going my way and you know, I'm working so hard and I'm not making enough money and all of that, uh, then you can kind of pull back because it's not just it's not just the outcome, but when we were going through the process of making that plan, uh, we unearthed a bunch of, of things to help us say, to prioritize, like mm, maybe that doesn't matter as much as we thought it did because that is that really gonna get us to the goal or is that just a task that we thought we needed to do? And all of that, swimming around that is probably more important than even the goal you settled on. Right, and there's, um because you've done the plan, you can look back and say, why, why didn't it hit? Or why did it hit? Um, and the, you know, it's, it's nice to know what part of the world is under your control and what yeah. part isn't. Yeah. And if you didn't hit something because of things you couldn't anticipate that weren't under your control, then you can really feel like you did your best. Mm -hmm. If it's because of things that were under your control, but you just wimped out, um, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So we do have a good question from Kim. She said, it's easy to adjust or recalibrate your goals when you've not met them. However, how, John, do you suggest people project adjustments when you've exceeded or overshot your goal? Like, how would you balance that with next year? Like, are you supposed to blow the... Well, that's where the party in? comes in, right? You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it resets your baseline for planning again. And so if you reached, if you went a lot farther than you expected, you look back and you go, okay, great. We're at a higher mountaintop than we thought we were going to be at. So where do we want to go next? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not to fall back and say, well, you know, our, we were setting for 25% growth every year. and We hit 45. Well, great. Do we want to go for 25 again next year? Or mm -hmm. do we want to increase it and look at our capacity, mm -hmm. look at the reasons that we hit that extra goal. And again, mm -hmm. if those reasons were uh, fortuitous, something just happened, fell in your lap, then maybe you go back to your original plan. Mm -hmm. If those things were things, oh, wow, we can now do better than we thought we could, then maybe you bump it up. Sure. If you, you know, this is a period of time too with COVID we've seen in, in especially Marina can attest to on the tax side, our clients, we don't have very many people that are kind of the same as last year. We have people that are thriving and people that are struggling. So if, if COVID has forced you to find efficiencies or find other ways to do things or to stop doing things that maybe you shouldn't have been doing that weren't quite so profitable, it's kind of been a, a, an involuntary um, cleanup and adjustment. So some people are going to get reap the benefit of that for years to come. So you could, you might say, you know, we continued to market during this time and now we've increased our market share um, as a result of, of yeah. you know, the adjustments from COVID. And, and so I think those are interesting. P more people we're going to be seeing as we approach our year in tax planning meetings, um, 75 a day, like Marina's having now, um, <laughs> as we adjust, as we get into that part of the, of the season for our firm, it's easy to really start to see the stride that people are hitting and saying, okay, now was that a blip on the radar or is this the new normal? Yeah. And one of the things I've heard a lot uh, from people about the pandemic is that the pandemic, this is from like futuristic thinkers, mm -hmm. the pandemic has been an accelerant to trends that were already in the works. Like there were people working from home or, you know, I, I was doing coaching through Zoom meetings way before the pandemic, but yeah. it's accelerated a lot of things. It's accelerated online education. Now that doesn't mean everybody's gonna learn everything online from kindergarten through your PhD, but there's a lot of those trends. People are looking and going, really, where do I wanna work? And where do I wanna live if I don't have to work in a big office building or if I don't have to come into the office every day? Can I come in for three or four days a month and live somewhere else You know, once we can fly again, obviously? Um, all those kinds of things have accelerated certain trends. And those are things you wanna look at and, and take advantage of. The one thing too is with the plan, uh, John, is um, I struggle a little bit in how you communicate your plan to your team. Um, and I know we've talked about it. it. It's easier for an entrepreneur or a business owner to have those 
roof shot, moon shot, and the hairy goal that is a, like a dream. Um, I, and I think when you come up with that plan and you have your, you know, it's kind of swimming in, in your head, when you are communicating, you have your staff meeting and you say, okay, well, our goal this year is to do, you know, A, B, and C. When you, at the back of your head, we're really hoping for this. So do you communicate that? Or do you say, well, but, you know, at the back of my mind, I have this hairy goal here. Here's mm -hmm. my gorilla goal. But if we hit here, it's okay. And so this is where I think it's, it's a bit of um. I don't know if it's finesse or if there's a good way that you would suggest to, to approach something like that. Well, the first thing you don't want to do is to go into a meeting with an idea in your head, but you're not saying it because you want everybody else to come up with your idea. That's mm -hmm. what we call passive aggressive. <laughs> and that's manipulation. Mm -hmm. You really want to find out when you have those goal setting meetings, you really want to find out where people believe they're at. And you as the leader can inspire them to believe things they didn't believe before. But you have to go in doing that. You say, I think we can hit here. What do you guys think? And what does that mean to you? A lot of times um, that's where the plan becomes more than the goal. It's like, well, mm -hmm. if we were going that way, what would that mean? And you turn it into things like, well, how many meetings do you need to have? How many sales do we need to make? How many customers do we need to serve? And how many hours will that take? And what kind of support will we need? And what kind of staffing will we need? Um, and sometimes entrepreneurs tend to be visionary and intuitive and we'll figure it out as we go along. Yeah. And we do many times, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not everybody is like that. And that can discourage some people. So you have to be aware of your people's strengths and weaknesses and their capacity uh, to grow. And that's where you have to deal with people where they're at and say, well, what's, what is bothering you about this? I sense that you don't believe in this. Well, why not? And they may have some good ideas. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They may have some things that you can change. Well, so, well, we can't do it with the people we have. Well, okay, great. We can get more people. Oh, I didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you can't do it with the space we have. Well, we can get more space. Um, so that's where that dialogue is really important. I don't think you should sell your vision short, but you can't get there without people. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep bringing your people along from where they're really at and from, you know, using their input in a sincere way. Mm -hmm. John, there's another question um, dis discussing if you have multiple streams of income, should you as the business owner be making one plan for each stream of income or should you have one broad plan that incorporates all the different facets of your income streams? Um, I'm going to say a little of both. What, the, what I mean by that is you're not going to hit each one without mm -hmm. each one having a separate plan. Mm -hmm. But then you have to look at, okay, in a whole unit, what are the resources that that requires in terms of time and money, effort, and, and really focus of the business owner? And is that, is that reliable? Is that, is that reasonable? Um, and ultimately, this comes back to, as a business owner, the first thing that I do with my clients is, what is your business going to give to you? What do you want from your business? And a lot of times when I see people with multiple streams of income, it's because neither, none of those streams are big enough for what they really want. And my question to them is, does that make sense? Sometimes it does, mm -hmm. but sometimes it would be better for them to focus on one or two streams of income and really build those up. Particularly if they want to build the business to where they can bring people on to be responsible for some of those streams and then move on to another one once they kind of go through that cycle. So like I said, it's a little bit of both, but you need a plan for each one. And then you need to look at the whole and say, do the resources make sense that it's going to take to do all those plans? Yeah. And I think it also lends itself to whether those multiple income streams are related 
Um, so we sometimes see um, folks in the real estate industry who might be selling real estate as a realtor and then maybe also have an appraiser license. So it's, you know, we, yeah. we, we sometimes see that where there's an overlap and sometimes it's just someone has their technical training and then they've got, I hate to say a hobby because that's got some negative tax connotation to it, but something that they're kind of doing for fun um, that they've turned into a business or passion or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we kind of see both ends of, of that spectrum too. And then you see some people that just get um, trapped. Right. I accidentally got an accounting degree and then I had <laughs> to do taxes and I really just wanted to go to law school. So, um, <laughs> and now I, I can't escape. accidentally got an accounting degree. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Best mistake I ever made. Don't get me wrong. But, um, but it, you know, I, I didn't start out of the gate like, Oh, I think I should be a CPA and now I have a firm. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so, you know, and this is particularly useful for your firm as we've talked about, but, um, the business model, the formula for a business model is uh, it's how you make money, but it involves the cost of acquiring a customer and then the cost of serving that customer and the lifetime value of that customer, how long they stay with you. When you have two or more related streams of income, usually you're capitalizing on the cost of acquiring that customer and then serving them in multiple ways. So it can add to your efficiency that way. Mm -hmm. That's why McDonald's says, you want fries with that? They already spent the money getting you in the store. Yeah. So sell them something else. I also wanted to uh, mention um, something about accountability. I think for us, I know personally, that has been the most important thing in making sure we stick to the plan or adjust the plan or have our goals because it's great to come up with these ideas and you sit down and you say, okay, I'm going to do this this year, even if I am able to break it down by quarter or by tax season or whatever, but without having, knowing that, okay, I need to report on that. And it has to be in a third party because it can be somebody inside your organization, but I think having um, someone outside who is okay. Well, you know, you, if you don't do it, you don't do it. It's not, you know, John doesn't, okay, well, you know, it's great satisfaction if we hit our goal, but it's not like you're going to come and close our firm down or anything like that. But it's just knowing that, hey, I committed to that now. And now I have to, it's just like going to exercise or losing weight or eating or whatever the case may be. It's the same thing. The accountability, I think, has been fantastic, where we know that we need to look at it every quarter, uh, breaking that further down into, you know, every two weeks or what have you and say, okay, yeah. have I done this and what steps and is it measurable? So I find too, when I'm talking about, especially now in tax planning and just, we have conversations about just running a business in general. And I always tell them, whoever it is, you need to get yourself a, a partner that you're accountable to for these goals for next year. Um, because I think that really does um, hold you down to your plan. Yeah, the good news about being an entrepreneur is we don't have a boss, and that's sometimes mm -hmm. the bad news uh, for mm -hmm. the accountability aspect of mm -hmm. it. Uh, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely play off of each other in a way that is um, very helpful. And then, of course, adding you to the mix um, helps mm -hmm. keep us honest, too. Yeah. So, <laughs> cool. well, thank you so much. This has really been, you know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that a lot of this is stuff you know, but it's, hard to sit down and and face it sometimes like oh i know i should do that but uh you know i know i should get a will but i don't i know i should have a plan um, but it's easy to be busy particularly at the year end this is a time of year where it's a good excuse being busy and having uh, you know family obligations and holiday obligations and and you know all of that it's easy to get caught up in so um, and sometimes the holidays are a good time to plan because <laughs> In some industries, there's not a lot of sales going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of people that are taking your meetings or taking your phone calls or whatever. And so this is a good time to scale back and say, okay, I'm going to look inside. Where are we going with this? Uh, but it is one of those things that's important, but not always urgent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say this like a perfect example is, is having a will. Uh, it's always important, uh, but it's not urgent until it's too late. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, we, as I said earlier, our webinar will be distributed 
um, on our Facebook page, on our websites, and on our YouTube pages so that you can catch it again if you'd like or share it with someone. If you've got topics you'd like to hear about in the future, please email us and let us know uh, what, what sounds good to you. We want to bring you content that is uh, helpful and meaningful to you. We are, speaking of planning, planning to take next Tuesday off since it's the Thanksgiving holiday so you can plan your menu. And we plan to be back on Tuesday, December 1st with tax planning tips. So we are in the, in, our plan is to do planning. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. thank you so much, everyone. If you need anything, let us know. Have a great week and we'll see you in two Tuesdays. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.